Welcome to the first webinar in the new Danish Sound Cluster. I'm Torben Bilskår, and I'm the head of our daily operations at the Danish Sound Cluster. We have been totally overwhelmed for the interest in our first webinars. Today, more than 75 have signed up for this web webinar. You can always follow our coming events on our website, in our newsletters. The next event will be on Tuesday next week with focus on the new Bluetooth LE audio standard. And for your information, we are planning to run a weekly webinar uh, beginning mid-August and onwards the rest of the year. Today, I'm pleased to introduce Professor Lars Kai Hessen from the Danish Technical University, who will give us an introduction to AI in audio. We are always uh, pleased to receive comments and proposals for new events. So don't hesitate to contact us. I'll just say enjoy the webinar and thank you for the support. Before we pass the screen to Lars Kai, my colleagues, Senior Thompson and Shelly Oprichard will give you a few outlines for the way we'll conduct this webinar. I think Senior, you will take over here. Thank you very much, Tobin. Hi, I'm Sina Thompson. I just started as a product manager 1st of May here in Danish Sound Cluster. I'm very happy to be here and happy to having so many attendees to this webinar. So I have uh, two practical uh, details uh, before we get started. First of all, there will be first a presentation followed by a Q&A session. Uh, but if you have any questions during uh, the presentation, the last uh, presentation, please don't hesitate to ask the questions in the chat. Uh, that's only a chat uh, function in this webinar. So write it all and Shelley will follow it uh, and read the questions aloud. Uh, secondly, after the webinar, we will, you will receive an email with the presentations, with the last presentation slides, uh, with a recorded a link to a recorded version of this webinar, uh, as long as other relevant links and uh, stuff coming up during this webinar. And actually, uh, a last uh, detail, also after uh, this webinar, we would love you to help us evaluate in the webinar, so you get an evaluation link also. Yes? Shelley? Thanks, Sina. Um, yeah, as Sina said, we are a new team and a new, uh, officially a cluster now, and we just started in May. So we're going to run a little poll here and just see where everyone is. Uh, from today. There are two questions. And the first one is, what do you work with? <laughs> which, which area are you working in? And the second one is, uh, which industry? This is our first uh, event today um, with the cluster. So it'll be great to see where you're from. Mm -hmm. Lots of voting is happening. Okay, 50% have voted. Just gonna wait another few seconds. <laughs> we can see a lot of, yes, acoustics and audio engineers, DSP engineers, and a lot of people working in with hearing aids. Great, you can see the results here and you can scroll down to see the second one. Thanks a lot for that. So I'll hand over to our um, speaker today, Lars Kai Hansen. Uh, as Torben said, he's a professor at DTU Compute and he has also brought along Martin who uh, works at, uh, is the founder of Dan Speech a Danish speech recognition technology. So I think uh, Lars will tell a bit more about that in, in a little while. Thank you, Lars. Yes, thank you. So let me uh, start by sharing. <clears throat> So you should uh, all see now my my first page of um, audio AI, and um, I hope you can hear me as well. So 
as much as I hate uh, speaking to you out of my basement, um, I have been looking very much forward to this uh, opportunity. So thank you to the Danish Sound Cluster for, uh, for um, inviting and uh, also for, for all of you to, to joining us today. Um, so I know many of you uh, are a list of, of, um, of participants and um, you're most welcome to, um, so I know you're, you're super interested in, in details also and um, much of what I'm going to say today is, is going to be sort of relatively high level uh, description. So if any of you are interested in, in more details uh, beyond uh, the links and so on, and you are talking to us about it, then you're, you're so welcome to contact us afterwards. Uh, so there's an email and I'm easy to find anyway. So um, let me see if I can move to the next slide. Um, so as you all know, um, the Danish Sound Cluster is, is a new incarnation of, um, of the networking activity in, in the Danish sound community. And I just want to use this opportunity also to uh, pay a tribute to my old friend, uh, Jan Larsen, who um, together with uh, a number of, of uh, strong actors in, in the sound community developed the uh, Danish sound network in its first incarnation, uh, starting uh, already in, in, in the North in 2009. So of course, my collaboration with Jan uh, goes uh, much uh, longer back. Uh, so. Basically, since he was a kid, he was working uh, at DTU, um, and I joined DTU when he was a student. Um, he did a lot of important work. Uh, some of it is, is still very active. So this little uh, thing on the right side is, is one of the uh, papers that, um, that he worked on that just recently uh, sort of started to, to gain a new interest. So it had it, its life a long time ago, but it also sort of was re- uh, discovered um, as a way of optimizing uh, deep neural networks. Um, so back in the times, we found a way to, um, to use uh, validation sets to um, compute the derivatives on validation sets. And that, uh, that's still sort of an, an interesting thing that uh, just part of his legacy. The sound uh, and audio AI that I'm going to talk to, to you about today, in particular, the, the stuff that comes from, from our own circles, um, it's also very much inspired by this collaboration. So we had a number of projects um, prior to um, prior to the co-sound project. That was sort of the, the main thing that uh, Jan was working in, uh, in cognitive sounds and the, the uses of sound. We had the intelligent sound project that, uh, that was funded by the research councils that uh, some of the examples that I'm going to show towards the end, uh, the, the old ones are uh, developed under that umbrella. Um, yeah, so just uh, paying some tribute to, uh, to some of the pioneers in this field. So I'm going to, uh, to speak about AI and um, AI is not something that has a sort of a nice uh, simple definition, but there are some thinkers that, uh, that have uh, aimed at, at, at a definition and, and certainly those who also the first use of the term, and that's uh, back, back to John McCarthy already in the 50s, the 1950s, as the science and engineering of intelligence. And this is very much how I think about it also. And, and I think this will be reflected in, in, in much of uh, what you hear from me today. Uh, so it has a, a broader uh, usage today. So basically anything that computes is, is AI because it's, it's, it's a clever way to, to market yourself often, uh, but um, AI is a, a, a really strong uh, research activity that is based on, on uh, this aim to, um, to bring what we recognize every day in other human beings uh, as intelligence to, to machines. Uh, there's a very long history uh, going even back uh, further than uh, John McCarthy's work, uh, himself, uh, but, but also um, there's an incredible amount of, of recent work, uh, things that are going on right as we speak. Uh, there are very big research questions that uh, I've listed a few here that uh, things that, that we're working on. So um, on the right side, there's a, a small picture of, of, um, of a network on the, on the top. And then on the, on the bottom, there's a graph, a little bit of graphics that um, shows you the developments in uh, performance of um, or error rates that you can say of the visual recognition systems. I'm going to show you some numbers and, and uh, similar things for speech recognition later, but right here, it's sort of what uh, started the, the deep learning revolution, namely um, the deep networks uh, for the um, ImageNet uh, challenge. 
And uh, in, in the short uh, time span that you're looking at uh, from uh, around 2010 to uh, 15, the error rate dropped uh, almost to, uh, to by, a, by an order of magnitude. And it was that dramatic increase in, in, in performance that have sparked the whole new wave of uh, AI that, uh, that I'm going to talk about today. What happened at the same time was that the, the, the models uh, grew uh, beyond belief. I mean, they are incredibly big models with millions of parameters. Um, as you can see the here in 15 already, the um, best competitor at the 4% was um, 152 layers of uh, computing. Uh, so expensive. And that's part of the thing I'm going to talk about also later today is that we have to reflect from time to time about the um, all the aspects of AI, including the uh, environmental aspects and like uh, footprints of, of uh, such an activity. In the little box at the very bottom uh, to the right, uh, it says something about how good humans are at this challenge. So if you if you take a random scientist, that's actually what they did. Um, the random scientist will be able to recognize objects in the ImageNet the challenge at around 10%, 9%, I think was what they ended up. Uh, but if you train humans, they can be much better. And, and that's actually a, sort of a separate point. So they can half the error rate, basically. Uh, that I'll also talk a bit about uh, later, uh, what that means for, for AI itself. That, uh, have to worry about um, the distributions of uh, expertise here. Um, so now, I think this slide is basically not even uh, necessary to show uh, because there, there's so much uh, in the news about uh, the promises of AI. So what is it that we can expect from AI, um, not the least in, in the audio arena? So at the very high level, of course, we hope that AI and, and uh, intelligence, uh, fast decision-making and so on can help us to tackle some of the very big issues like climate, economy, safety and defense and so on. And, and much of the activity uh, is, is derived from that uh, dimension. Um, but when we speak about audio, there are audio dimensions to that also, of course, but uh, when we speak about audio, it's very much uh, personal services that we are thinking of. Um, medical audio, well-being, entertainment, uh, not the least, uh, has been a, a strong driver um, for, uh, in the personal service space. And, and this, uh, this raises a whole lot of interesting issues itself that it's personal, uh, so I'll speak about that later also. If we sort of uh, look at the philosophical side of it, you can see that there's sort of a progression of, um, of what technology, uh, digital technology has offered and where AI is sort of uh, still uh, maybe promising, but maybe still not completely delivering, but we look forward to it. So in the 90s, you could say that uh, one of the major digitalization step there was that we got this incredible boost in communication uh, brought about uh, first of all by mobile that uh, certainly we could uh, communicate with uh, friends and colleagues uh, where, wherever it were and they were not uh, uh, attached with a, a stationary phone. In the uh, early part of, the, of this um, century, I mean, the big thing that happened in digitalization was that uh, our memory was uh, massively improved. Uh, so this is mostly due to, to Google, but if you sort of broaden the scope and look at the goods, uh, commerce and so on, and friends, not the least, um, you can count in Amazon and, uh, and Facebook as well in, in that uh, process of um, sort of increasing the reach and accessibility of uh, data. So what is it that AI is sort of uh, promising here now in, in, in the, currently or maybe in the next uh, 10, 10 years is to, to boost uh, what we think of as intelligence. So this would be using the two first communication and, and the vast uh, memory that we have, we have access to, to improve reasoning and decision-making, uh, making it much more reliable, uh, safe and, and also uh, faster at the least. And uh, as I, I mentioned, a few of the companies that are sort of leading the way in, in, the, in the two first spaces, you can ask the question sort of who's leading, what is happening now? And uh, it's also to a large extent, Google and Facebook, but, uh, but they are very important uh, Chinese players also in this field. Um, so the whole AI revolution has, has many uh, fathers and mothers, um, many of them in the US, of course, uh, big tech, but uh, certainly in China, increasingly in Europe and uh, to a large extent also in, in Denmark. Uh, I'd say that um, we focus a lot on business and, and the business role in, in AI, but many of the basic ideas, they still come from universities. And um, 
universities still provide a lot of basic research. Um, we also, uh, from time to time, maybe reflect uh, more freely on the consequences. So this is what I call safe AI that I'm going to speak a bit about. But uh, the important, maybe most important thing that we, that we provide um, beyond uh, the two first uh, items, of course, are brains. Uh, so we can educate students and uh, spread the, uh, the good um, uh, message and, and, and the whole uh, uh, information level is increasing when, when students uh, take in a job in, in companies. Um, and the, the last part of it, uh, the education part, uh, is also currently expanding. So we have started the new AI and data education at DTU, and uh, the first students, uh, bachelors, uh, are now arriving from that education. So what do we teach the AI students? Uh, so I'm head of the section for cognitive systems at um, DTU. And we have uh, three main areas that we, that we research in and that we teach the students. So machine learning is very important. And much of what I'm going to talk about, sort of the core of that activity is, is uh, machine learning. Uh, the two other uh, equally important aspects to, to, uh, to AI are cognition, so how uh, humans work and how we represent uh, knowledge in, in, in our realm, in the brain and in, in the, our memories. And equally important is, is what we call computational social science. This is how we, we work together and we have uh, very successful projects also in the computational social science uh, dimension. Uh, the reason that we can do all the stuff that we do is that there's been a very high acceptance from Danish uh, industry. Uh, and I would, in particular, um, talk about the uh, hearing systems. Uh, so the big hearing aid companies, they have been uh, instrumental for, for the uh, developments, both at the very concrete level of uh, collaborating with us, uh, even sometimes funding research, but of course, by, by motivating and, and also uh, accepting uh, the um, the whole idea of uh, bringing AI into products. I mean, that the Danish hearing industry is, is very much ahead of, uh, of the world there. Um, nowadays, a lot of this is happening also in startups. So as you had mentioned that also has a very important uh, impact that uh, this research has, of course, is that uh, many of the students, they go on to develop the startups like peer grids, like experience and coaching and so on. Skip this. So, we, if, if there's some interest in, in the particular uh, what we're doing with the students in the AI and data, uh, we can go back to that slide in the discussion. So, uh, on this um, notion of, of what we are teaching the students, um, let me sort of bring a few more headlines in. So, I have these four items that I find as characterizations of intelligent systems, um, including intelligent audio systems. And as you can see, I, I in the headline that it's different from data fitting. And, and that's my own sort of uh, personal uh, view on this, that uh, data fitting is, is super interesting, but it's only a, a relatively small part of the story. Uh, the, the more important part is that these systems, they have senses and actions. So they listen and they uh, react based on how they, what they listen to, what they hear. Uh, they're also learning systems, of course. So there's a certain amount of data fitting, but the important part of that learning is that it's active. Uh, so I'm going to tell you about uh, an example a little bit later. Uh, one of our hearing aid companies that are actually using learning already in their products. So this is not sort of like an esoteric idea that is floating in academia. This is real, real world activity. Also. Then they have social competences, these systems, so they can communicate and they understand emotion. So um, towards the end, we're going to show you a, a small uh, video, a demo of uh, a system that, um, that actually does a bit of, of emotion detection uh, also for, uh, based on audio. And then uh, the last and maybe most important point is how you evaluate these systems. And that is by bringing them live online. So we really uh, uh, like these systems to be um, agents in, 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 in the real world. Uh, both in, in the academic sense that, that we can do experiments, but also in the uh, concrete sense that they can be, uh, say, uh, form a startup or uh, be part of a product uh, in, in a more conventional business. Um, so this means that we need to worry about real-time uh, operation. And um, I'm using the word conscious here, and, and many people frown when they hear that uh, concept uh, because it's, it's so alien to think about machines being conscious. If you want to, to know more about the way we think about uh, consciousness in, in the machine context, uh, the second reference at the bottom, uh, I will share the slides afterwards, the second reference by um, one of our uh, guest professors, uh, Sid Coyder from Paris, 
discuss that in, in great detail, how one should think about uh, sort of uh, what consciousness is in, in human beings and what role it plays from a computational point of view, and why it's relevant also for, for the system. So it has a lot to do with coordination between senses, for example. So um, I'm quite optimistic, as you can hear, uh, on what we can uh, hope from, from AI. And um, part of that optimism comes from, uh, from this paper also. Um, so this is um, on, on what you would call the broader impact of AI. So it, it's measured in times of the sustainable development goals. So these are values that um, the whole of the UN system has discussed at length, uh, they're very detailed. Um, there are many so-called targets. So each of uh, these sustainable development goals, we have 17 of those. And each one has a number of, of targets. So these are KPIs that we hope the world can, can meet to, to better itself. So now, of course, there's an obvious question. Is, is AI going to help or destroy <laughs> sustainable development goals? And it depends on who you ask. But um, this particular team uh, decided to, to take a very broad and holistic view on it, including the complicated question of, of dependency between the goals. Uh, so the different targets and goals and so on, they influence each other and AI has a complicated role in that game. But after uh, many uh, discussions and a very, uh, many of them you can see in the paper uh, from Nature Communications here, um, <clears throat> the conclusion is that it's overwhelmingly positive what uh, AI has to contribute. And um, I, I encourage you to take a, a look at it. Uh, so for example, environment and economy and so on, there are many advantages. And at the end, they, they sum it up as saying that uh, 134 targets, uh, we have positive impact and 59 are, are negative. So 59 uh, doesn't sound good. And, and this means that we still have to be very much sort of alert to this uh, issue. And uh, one particular sort of uh, alarm that is often ringing is, uh, is that of um, free will, say, independent autonomy of the individual and so on, and uh, what the uh, media does to that. And uh, here are two audio case stories uh, that uh, you'd say are not so sound, uh, AI. So it's, it's a little bit random that it's both Alexa. Um, it just popped up when, when I looked for it. Uh, I have another slide with, with many others with, with other uh, agents, uh, audio-based agents. But these are sort of um, very clear sort of examples of uh, what can go wrong if we have something that uh, we think is intelligent, but it's not quite intelligent. Uh, so the first example, uh, and, and you can again, you can, you can look at uh, the references later on to get all the details. I'm, I'm sure many of you know about this, but so the first one is, is, a, is a really bad case of the misunderstanding of what, the, um, what Alexa does. Um, and um, basically there's a couple uh, fighting, uh, arguing in front of Alexa and uh, Alexa uh, mistakenly uh, takes it as a message, uh, part of what they say that uh, a message should, there should be some transcription and a message should be sent. And then uh, Alexa asked who should it be sent to? And then there's a list of friends and one friend's name apparently came up in the discussion, meaning that at the end, Alexa sends a transcript of the argument uh, to one of the friends, right? That's something that you would not like to happen. So that's an example of uh, not having social competences, right? I mean, if, if Alexa uh, knew about uh, friendship and what you expect from friends and so on, this would not be one of the, one of the things. The other, uh, the second case at the bottom is, um, is not based on, on, um, on, on listening to, uh, to, to, uh, to a sound, but uh, producing sound. Uh, so this is Alexa in the Uncanny Valley, as it says here. So Uncanny Valley is a concept where a um, machine becomes just realistic enough that it starts to become scary. So here it's uh, Alexa that in the middle of the night for no reason starts to laugh. Uh, so it's like you have a clown in your bad bedroom, right? That's not something you'd like. <laughs> um, it's, it's a phobia to be as scared of clowns, but I think even, even me who's not, not uh, I, I don't suffer from that phobia, but uh, having somebody starting to laugh in, in, in the bedroom would probably scare me anyway. Um, these are just sort of hilarious examples. I mean, you can, you can uh, laugh. Uh, uh, I mean, nobody was, was seriously hurt. But it still sort of shows the uh, the problems that that we have to think about in, in terms of um, the whole issue of of deploying AI in the real world. Um, so I'm going to speak about a particular kind of uh, personal service, uh, and that is um, how to uh, to navigate uh, spoken documents. So this could be audiobooks or or uh, in our case uh, podcasts. Um, 
So this is in the realm of, of personalized services. And um, in, in, the, in, in that uh, area, uh, there's sort of an obvious issue with uh, privacy. Uh, and audio data is, is uh, extremely sensitive, or can be extremely sensitive and, and private. So why is it that, that we need to, to collect all this uh, private data? Why is it that uh, Google and Amazon and uh, Facebook and so on, they are so obsessed with uh, getting access to our personal data? So let me try and see if I can explain that in just a few words here. Uh, so um, the first uh, bullet point, the human variability, that's a, that's a prime uh, reason. So most of you uh, from school remember, at least uh, if not in your practical uh, daily work, you know about the normal distributions. The normal distributions on the top uh, left, uh, right side, the blue curve. So it, it's, it's basically sort of like a, a frequency of occurrence of something. So it, this could be IQ, for example, that there'll be an example uh, that has that distribution. So sort of a generic uh, aspect of, of a human, um, like uh, performance in tests, right? So we are roughly, uh, equal all of us. So we roughly have a hundred uh, of that scale. There's a variation, some have a little bit more, some have a little bit less. And then we know how, as humans, we know how to navigate uh, once we sense whether uh, we have a, a somebody in the middle or in the top or in the bottom, we know how to, how to handle that. It's, it's a relatively small uh, sort of uh, space of variability that we see. So, uh, this is most of, of what we do in statistics is based on that distribution that we assume that things are simple and that they're sort of roughly a mean value, one uh, size fits all. But when we come to all the interesting aspects of human life, uh, that's not how it works. And, and I think on, you probably have reflected on it already, but otherwise uh, after a little bit of reflection, it's, it's easy to understand that, that humans, we know humans are different and anything they do, interesting things they do are, are very different between people. So this means that we have very different uh, distributions. So the, the frequency of occurrence, I don't know if you can see my cursor here. So the, the histograms of, of uh, how a particular property of a human being occurs is very much like this, um, what we call long tail distribution. Uh, so we have like this yellow uh, figure that, um, that has zero on the, on the starting of the axis and then it goes to high values. And there, there's, a, there's a few, a small amount of people that have very high values. So think of playing tennis, for example, we have only one uh, Vosniaki in Denmark. The most of us are in, in, in the zero, right? We, we are not very good at, um, at playing tennis. And uh, the, the, the fact is that uh, all the things that we practice for something, so there's a whole something called the power of practice. So whatever we practice something, something we're good at, educate ourselves in some direction, for example, playing tennis or solving equations and so on, an axis like this develops. So there are some that uh, they have spent the time uh, uh, to, to, to learn this practice and then uh, the rest uh, that, that have not. And we have uh, hundreds, if not thousands of that kind of uh, uh, properties in a human being. So this means that we have this very complicated distribution uh, where we can be very, very different from the rest. Um, so one of the first places this was discovered at length was in the uh, um, all of behavior. So this was uh, limits to, to predictability and human ability, a paper by, uh, by the Barbasi group in Boston that showed that this was the case for, for human uh, motion. But there's a ton of these effects also in, in audio, in speech and so on. But we had these uh, indiv huge individual differences. And basically it means in order to predict one particular human being, we know, need to know the history of that particular human being. So that's why Google needs to have your data and not your neighbor's data. It cannot predict you from your neighbor's data. So, like, so our traditional recommendations, they simply do not work. Uh, so that's that's already one uh, really important reason for uh, for this um, need for for private data, uh, personal data for personalized services. Um, there's one that I'm not going to to spend a long time discussing because then all the time goes for that, and that's the the fact that we don't even know ourselves many of these uh, dimensions. Uh, so this is what I call hidden information that we need to basically read your mind to, to learn, and that makes uh, that compounds the problem even more. Of course. Uh, so sometimes I, I say this in headlines that um, we need uh, the person, we need the AI for the personalized services to do AI. We need personal data, and of course, for, for to get access to the personal data, we need trust. We need to, the user to trust us, uh, and that is what Alexa was fighting. Now, in order to do that, we have developed what we call the safe AI. So that's this checklist of um, dimensions that we would like our AI systems to to uh, to live up to. 
And many of the dimensions that I already talked about, they, uh, they, they are covered here. So this goes anywhere from, um, from this, uh, that the AI system knows its own role in creating realities. This is what we call self-consciousness. Or for example, this uh, privacy, uh, very important privacy that it can keep secrets if, if necessary. If you want to know more about uh, the sort of the perils and the promises in, in AI, I can warmly recommend the two new books that, um, that are uh, pictured at the bottom right. Uh, so Kate Crawford's book. But it, it's also uh, super important uh, that the people that are interested in AI, that they, they see those uh, dimensions like uh, the climate effects and uh, what can it mean for emotion and so on. The other book by uh, Brian Christian is, is uh, on values. Um, so we need to think about the values of, of the AI systems. Uh, so we, if we deploy a, a system, a, a, anything but the most trivial AI systems, they will reflect values. And this is one of the big problems at the moment is that the, those values that the, say big corporations like Facebook, the values they have on the systems, they're not necessarily aligned with your own values. And then, then the, the whole power issue that Kate Crawford is discussing at length uh, comes in that uh, we shouldn't have to, the, the powers shouldn't be too asymmetric so that Facebook can control you too much. You have to negotiate from a symmetric position is what they say, so we can make fair deals, right? But it's a big discussion and I'm very happy to go back to, to this also uh, later in the, um, in the discussion. One aspect that I, that I do want to mention is, is sort of a, a, an important new development that is happening in, in the digitalization uh, and, and in relation to AI. It's, it's the use of uh, knowledge graphs. Uh, so here is um, sort of an audio related example. And that's uh, how to understand emotion in, in, um, in speeches. Uh, so first, let me uh, just say a few words what a knowledge graph is. Yeah, so as it says here, we all use us. So a knowledge graph is, is a collection of facts. So uh, think Wikipedia, for example. So Google is a very intense user of, of uh, knowledge graphs. The use for anything that's happening in, in Google is based on, on the knowledge of, of the world. So for example, if you query for, for Copenhagen, then uh, it will show you all the information. So it will show you some links to things where you can learn more about. Uh, that's the typical indexing that it does. Uh, for example, Wikipedia's article, but then it'll also show you some uh, some facts about Copenhagen. So, for example, the map, where is it, and how does it look? Um, and it'll likely also tell you what it costs to fly there. Uh, assuming that you're not in, in Copenhagen, it will tell, tell you that uh, you can actually uh, travel to Copenhagen. And if you're far away, it'll suggest a flight. And if it's close, maybe a, a train trip. So all this specific information that, uh, that Google knows about the world is used together with the AI systems. Uh, so this means that they have this kind of memory, active memory that, uh, that we have also. So this is a very sort of, I'd say a hallmark of intelligence that you have access to a knowledge graph. So we need to have that also in our audio systems. And there's a small example on, on, the, on the right side. So this is a transcribed uh, speech. So this is Trump's inaugural address. Um, and this was actually analyzed with some um, emotion detection tools that were developed by Finor Nielsen at the DTU. Uh, so he made an open source uh, so-called sentiment lexicon that was used by the data journalists at the Washington Post. And what you can see is, is sort of a timeline uh, through the talk uh, of a presentation by Trump. And you, you can see that it starts out positive, then it becomes negative. Uh, the whole world is, is a big problem and now he's going to solve it, right? That's the, the end of the talk. Uh, so the, the knowledge graph here is sort of how to transform speech, uh, the, the text that uh, was transcribed from the speech, how to transform that into to emotion and how to conclude sort of what are the emotions that this part of the speech is arising, arousing in the uh, audience. Uh, emotion is important for, for all kinds of communication, of course, and so we need to be able to understand emotion also in, in audio. Let's turn more to, uh, to the specifics of uh, audio. Uh, and I'll say one of the big things that have happened in, in audio processing uh, concerns precisely this phenomenon of uh, transcribing uh, speech. So uh, in the model lingo, it's called speech to text. And uh, if you want to, to again, uh, dig into the details, I can rec recommend you to, uh, to look at the word error rates. So that's the uh, sort of small pun that we have in the title of, of that uh, web page in, in GitHub. Uh, where are we? So they show um, 
how the development, uh, very similar to what I showed for, for ImageNet, um, we have um, several big uh, speech data sets. So library speech um, is one of them. Uh, it's it's a relatively uh, nice speech in the sense that it's it's typically audio books where people have read something. So it's it's uh, maybe the best possible case for, for audio. And that's reflecting also in the very small error rates that you see here. But still, there's been a huge dynamics in, in, in how these systems have developed over time. So we have, a, a, again, an access that goes sort of roughly from, from uh, so here it's from 2016 to, to current. In 16, uh, a very influential system was developed uh, at, um, by Baidu, uh, the Chinese equivalent of, of Google, uh, Deep Speech 2. And um, you can see that it uh, had a very low error rate, already around 5% uh, 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 word error rate. But over the years, this has dramatically improved. So all kinds of interesting tricks has happened uh, in, in those uh, five years. And our work that you can see there is now the latest from Google, uh, published the stuff from Google, called Pushing the Limits of uh, Semi-Supervised Learning for Automatic Speech Recognition, where they pull out all the tricks that we have developed over the last years, uh, including um, manipulating uh, speech to, to what we call data augmentation that I'll mention also later, and um, learning uh, without supervision, for example, um, and also, of course, uh, ma massively uh, increasing the size of the network and the, the form of them. So that's what they call a conformer, um, ending up with something that is uh, about uh, a quarter of what, uh, what happened in, in 16. Um, so this is very important for uh, for the field, of course, that we have these super efficient uh, deep learned uh, networks. There are also uh, the other dimensions. So the ones we have uh, transcribed the uh, audio into to, uh, to words to text, then we can use natural language representation. So working with text as uh, statistical objects. So that is moving very fast. Also, again, uh, Google has been very important. So they developed the so-called word to vec that uh, creates a representation for each word. And it, it, it's a super interesting thing itself. So if you haven't seen it, I can really recommend you to Google that and see some of the blocks with the, describe the fun uh, stuff we can do with the uh, words in word to vec representation. Facebook, uh, Facebook uh, did a similar thing for fast text. And uh, there are many other uh, more, even more powerful uh, tools available now. So one of the things that you can start to dream of uh, now we have these tools is to, to, uh, to work much more with the spoken documents. So as I mentioned, this could be uh, many forms uh, like uh, radio news or podcasts or uh, audio books and so on. So is it possible really to, to start to, to index and understand that kind of media at the same level as we could, can do with the uh, things we see on the internet as, uh, as text, right? Uh, so that's, that's the big question that we're going to, to discuss. But before we do that, let me just say that uh, there's a lot of uh, super interesting thing happening also in Denmark, as I mentioned many times in the audio sector. So here again, some links uh, that you can you can um, have a, a closer look at yourself, some white papers. Uh, these are really interesting applications of, um, of the technology that I'm talking about here, uh, AI technology that goes beyond mere data fitting. So for example, in Vitex, um, first it was the, uh, instrument called Evoke. Um, they, they completely changed the business using uh, AI. And I'll say the, the big change there is that they do precisely what I, I mentioned before, that they started to contact, be in contact with the user. So earlier on, you could say that hearing instruments were developed by very refined information from uh, audiologists. So there were hearing clinics where the people um, interacted with the hearing clinic and then the information from the hearing clinic then were moved to the sign of the hearing aids. With the development of apps that can control the hearing aids, uh, there's certainly a, a, a big uh, open uh, gate to, uh, to con uh, learning directly from the user. And this is exactly what is happening here. So uh, small experiments are carried out uh, using active learning protocols. You can say in a popular wording that the human is in the loop. So we have an AI system directly interacting with the user, this, uh, deciding on uh, small experiments that uh, can improve the setting of the hearing aid. Uh, similar is happening at the Proticon also. Uh, so there are two things that I mentioned here. So one is uh, to use these methods uh, directly for improving uh, the whole uh, representation of the sound. So, so uh, deconstructing the sound picture, basically using uh, deep networks and uh, massive amounts of uh, data. Another thing that is, is going on right now, so this I should mention also that uh, the, the first was developed uh, in, uh, by 
by Jan Larsen and, 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 uh, and his students uh, that were industrial PhD students at the time, Jens Brehm. Um, the uh, Oticon system, uh, the deep speech uh, manipulation and separation is done with the Casper uh, Center and uh, Research Center in Aalborg. At our place, again, there's uh, current work on, on recommender systems. So this is like uh, thinking about settings of hearing aids as something that you can index. So this means you can find the relevant ones uh, for a specific situation. But very interesting. And, and uh, internationally, these are leading uh, efforts, of course, in the use of AI and audio. Now let me turn to, um, to the uh, final topic um, of, of this presentation. So become even more specific. Um, with um, sort of something that I see as a really fun and interesting application of uh, AI in audio, and that's indexing uh, audio. So the particular idea that, that, that we are working on is uh, to index the uh, podcasts. Uh, so this is something that we have um, worked on before. Uh, so in, in the Intelligent Sound Project, in, uh, yeah, about 15 years ago, uh, 10, 15 years ago, we developed the first uh, podcast search engine for a CNN podcast, uh, something we call Cast Search. But now we have much better tools, uh, both to transcribe. Uh, as, as I mentioned, transcription has uh, moved a lot, so we get much cleaner text. So much of the effort we did in the old system was to sort of make up for all the errors that the audio uh, to, uh, to speech, uh, audio to, to text uh, transcription tool created a high word error rate. And therefore, we had to, uh, to have very robust uh, statistical systems for for navigating and indexing. Since then, so I would say also at that time, uh, these were CNN podcasts and uh, it was a little bit esoteric. Uh, not many people in Denmark, for example, listened to, uh, to podcasts at that time, but uh, that's of course completely changed now. So podcast is a booming market. Um, on the right side, you see the picture of uh, Matt Stephenson. Uh, so it was big news uh, when, when he moved his show from, uh, from Denmark's radio to, uh, to the uh, local, uh, Podimo, the Danish company uh, that uh, both is a sort of a directory and, and a service that provides uh, podcasts, but also produces uh, their own premium content like uh, Mass and A. Hollow. So it's a huge market and uh, there are very big players already. So uh, there are some uh, clips from, um, from the media uh, and you can read the articles. So there's a link to it. So in, in 19, uh, for example, uh, Spotify spent uh, a whole lot of money to buy Gimlet um, and uh, sort of made their way into to, uh, podcasts. Um, and in that article, it says that there was this earlier example uh, where iHeart Media bought another um, podcast uh, for $55 million. So, so these are pretty uh, high uh, priced uh, startups that, that are working in this area just to indicate sort of how important it is. But of course, uh, Spotify is a big player now in podcasts, but the biggest player is Apple, uh, and it's a huge industry for, for Apple. And there's also a lot of interest in, in this in uh, yeah, uh, Amazon, and the, uh, there are a few really interesting uh, small companies that uh, you could take a look at also, uh, PodSearch, PodSites, and the Listen Notes that are sort of the podcast uh, search engines along the um, lines that I'm going to talk about now. So all the search engines that, uh, that we see, uh, both at Spotify, at Apple, and um, Listen Notes and so on, they're based on metadata and keywords. So sort of very traditional search. Uh, so they don't um, sort of index into the podcast. Uh, Google has made some experiments. As far as I know, you cannot see it in Denmark. Uh, so I, I've only seen clips of it from, from outside Denmark where um, Sometimes when you search for something, Google will actually give you links, not only to, to web pages like we showed before with the Copenhagen uh, maps and so on, but also sometimes into podcasts. So there, there's an interest in, in, in uh, using these techn technologies for, for doing more careful indexing of uh, podcasts. So um, let me try to broaden the view a little bit on, on, uh, on what uh, sort of is, is interesting for, um, for that. Um, Sort of scientific question relating to um, to podcasts. So the one obvious question, of course, is what would you like to index in the first place? So you could say that um, a very sort of basic thing, and that's that's what I understand that the Google is doing, doing is that they transcribe the podcast, and then they simply have a text where they think of that as a conventional text, like it was text on the internet. So you could use all the in, uh, natural language processing and representation that I've talked about to, uh, to, to do that kind of search. 
but there could be many other things that uh, one could attend to in, in audio. And it's a little bit like the picture of the dog uh, on, on the right side, that it, it's a very complicated picture. And uh, it has a lot to do with human imagination, right? What, uh, what you could be interested in searching for. So one of the interesting things about this picture that you see, so I, I hope you can all see the dog. Um, once you see it, you can't unsee it again. It, it's, it just pops out in your, in your vision. One of the interesting things that we can do uh, with such a picture is that we can imagine the dog moving. We can Im imagine this was a video and just starting to move. And that's, that's the, then for example, the legs of the dog uh, would, uh, would have their own meaning, right? So it would be something that we could ask for, how many, how many legs can you see from this dog um, in the picture, for example, right? So, so the, what you can index in something is, is basically what you can attend to in the, in the uh, psychology, psychological sense. And, and that's a really interesting question that, that is also starting to, to, to be understood for, for audio. So we've had the whole field of research that, that is an old one, which is called the scene analysis, auditory scene analysis. And there's even a book, a very important book in that field called computational scene analysis of how to do that by, by machine. But, uh, but it's, it's really an interesting question and something that, uh, that we have been working on for a, for a long time. Uh, so basically we have this cocktail party of many things going on at the same time. And what, what, can, what can we sort of attach interest to and what could we in principle be interested in searching for? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time here with uh, those uh, quotes, but this is more sort of specifically what we mean by attention. So this is uh, an old concept that goes back to, to William James. So uh, in, in, in the uh, projects that I mentioned before, we developed sort of like a view of this, uh, that um, what, what is an object or what a chunk is, what the psychologists call it also sometime in, in, in audio uh, context. And there we, we sort of uh, ended up with a, or converged to a, to a definition and say that, that an object is something that can, has independent behavior. It's something that can move by itself. So in, in, in computer vision, that's a sort of a pretty obvious thing, but what does it mean in audio? And um, we can only speculate, and, and we are sort of in the, in the process of uh, coming to that conclusion. We, we developed also practical computational tools, um, some of it with uh, the student Ling Feng, uh, who uh, discovered these uh, very important structures in, 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 in many different media, including the speech and music and in social interaction and so on, based on, on the independent component analysis finding things that can move independently in, in, in signals would be independent comp components. Uh, so she discovered that uh, there is an important structure in, 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 uh, in audio, in, in speech, for example, that goes beyond the text. Um, so let's see if I can just go to the next page and then skip the path here. And this one also. So here we go to uh, four different um, timescales of independency in, in audio. And um, only the, the first one of them, the, what is called the phoneme here, is related to, to the content, the speech content. Uh, as you can see, the, the other dimensions have to do with the with the person that actually speaks, right? So there's the gender of the person and the height and even the differences between people turns out to sort of uh, reveal itself as these independences. So those uh, dimensions that we have here, for example, the phone name, the gender, the uh, height and the identity and many, many other things are things that we could in principle be interested in indexing for uh, an audio signal, right? For, um, for a podcast, for example interested in, in finding uh, podcasts by specific people or listen to segments of a podcast where a particular person uh, happens to, to speak, right? So those are the things that, uh, that we'll try to bring into this uh, big research project on, on podcast uh, indexing and segmentation. I'll skip these next uh, slides also because of time. We can return to them later. Let me move on. I'm going to skip a little bit here just to, to, to tell you a little bit about how we are solving these problems. So I have two um, uh, earlier services that we built uh, that, uh, that bring in uh, ideas that we are now uh, expanding on. So one is the, the music search engine that we built that is called Musica. So it, it uh, does uh, this knowledge graph uh, enhanced machine learning that we talked about. So it finds from the query, it finds uh, relevant information in Wikipedia. So if, if you query for Arcade Fire, see that's an old uh, band, then uh, it'll look that up in Wikipedia and then it'll give you some examples of how we can interpret that uh, two word uh, qu query. 
in in uh, terms of of the band itself, maybe uh, songs and so on. And then uh, the function of the search engine was that it produced a link to to uh, YouTube uh, to uh, to hear the song, for example, right? Or a link to Wikipedia to uh, to show the band page. Uh, so this is this combination of knowledge graph information with uh, more traditional uh, machine learning uh, in order to to serve the the personalized uh, or give the personalized service in, in in a very productive way, right? The um, other uh, service that I'm going to talk about is, is much more recent one. And it's it's based on um, the uh, Danish version of uh, Deep Speech two two, and that's how it it started. Uh, so now we're um, talking about the Dan Speech project that I uh, had a, a little um, picture of at the at the very first slide also. So um, in a moment we're going to uh, to show you a, a little video uh, how. Um, and speech uh, can can uh, transcribe and also interpret uh, the um, audio signal. So it's based on on state of the art uh, speech to text. Um, so there's, as, as many of you know, there's been a lot of activity in transcription in Denmark. Um, there's been university uh, projects and also uh, startups working on this. And uh, <clears throat> a couple of years ago, we started working on this uh, with uh, two students at that time, uh, Martin and, and Rasmus. And in their master project, they uh, developed a, a Danish version of uh, Deep Speech 2. Uh, so that uh, system uh, immediately brought us um, to the level of what uh, Google can do, for example, in the API uh, that Google produces for uh, from, uh, business applications. And now the uh, Innovation Foundation Denmark has uh, supported uh, what they call an Inno Explorer grant uh, to, to make something that eventually will become a product um, out of, of that um, research activity. So the idea is to, to produce open source solutions and then uh, provide services based on, on those solutions. And you can already now go and, and have a look at the, um, at the open source uh, of the uh, Deep Speech 2 version. So we're improving it also by, by many of the tricks that uh, brought the uh, error rate down from the uh, Four or five uh, percent uh, word error rate that you saw um, Deep Speech had. Uh, so this is including some tricks that uh, that Facebook has developed uh, that can uh, train without uh, transcribed uh, labels, but also improving on language models and so on. Um, and no matter what we do, we we always in the situation that that we have much less data than uh, than Google and and, and uh, the other competitors have. So we have to be clever about um, using that data. So much of the work that uh, took place in the in the master project and still uh, working well for us is the so-called data augmentation, where we multiply data by um, manipulating the the speech. Uh, so in in um, in the learning problem, we have. Uh, the, the speech and we have uh, the, uh, a transcription of uh, the text and then we can create a new speech for example by manipulating the uh, the pitch in the uh, speech or by creating um, another uh, sound environment around it for another echo structure for example so one example can be multiplied into many uh, and in the specific case uh, 10 20 30 times uh, more uh, samples can be created that are sort of realistic variations different types of noise and so on so it becomes much much more robust system, and that, that was one of the tricks that uh, made the system work uh, really at uh, state of the art. Another thing that we have a sort of an important eye at is uh, the whole privacy uh, issue that we talked about. That much of the information that we have, audio uh, speech between people, say in a call center or between a doctor and a patient, and so on, is, is super private. So we have to be really careful uh, with uh, the uh, privacy by design tools. Uh, so that's also an important area for us. So um, I'll just uh, round off and then um, then we will uh, go back and um, maybe we can uh, run the, the demo in a second. Let me just uh, end up with the conclusions here. And um, first of all, I'll say that um, the audio processing and representations we create, uh, they are really productive when they're compatible with human perception and cognition. So. We need to be able to understand what the networks are doing, and they need to be able to communicate with us you know, in a sense that can be used. Then also, I think we have learned over the years that uh, we can actually index audio in pretty interesting ways. Uh, so that's what I call deep indexing here. 
And uh, it becomes even more interesting if it connects with knowledge graphs. Uh, so basically nuggets of, of human knowledge. And this means also that, um, that we can speak with people about what we have found. So this deep indexing and understanding it in terms of the Wikipedia knowledge graphs, for example, is, is a super interesting concept itself. Um, I think this area, we can be proud of uh, all the things that you guys are doing. Uh, so the Danish sound community, the Danish sound cluster and so on. Um, it's really uh, impressive what uh, Denmark has to contribute here. And now I've, I've mentioned uh, the, the two hearing aid companies as, as particular examples because we know them well, but, but there are many more examples out there and there will be a lot of activity in the future in this area. So I see a, a blooming uh, industry um, that, that takes advantage of all the deep knowledge we have of, uh, of audio and then combine it with uh, all the tricks that we can play with uh, AI tools. So uh, yeah, basically what is next? Yeah, we have to find out, right? Uh, and if you're interested, then uh, you're more than welcome to work with us to, to find out. Thank you. Hi, Julie. I think he is still muted, probably. That's why. <laughs> it's my head. You, <laughs> you can hear me now. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for that. And we have Martin and Rasmus here. Are they? Yes, exactly. So going uh, to run the demo. Martin and Rasmus are, uh, are the, the two that uh, created the dance speech. And uh, if we if we should uh, just have a quick uh, break before the discussion, then we can run this uh, little demo. So I think the way I'm going to do it is that I'm going to I'm going to start it and share it, and then I think we'll stop it, and then we will just go come back and explain what is in because it's it's a very complicated picture we are showing you. So we'll just explain you what what you're looking at, and then we'll let it run for for a little bit more time. Let's see if we can first start it. Uh. Grundlæggende har det været rimelig forfærdeligt en stor del af tiden. Øhm, men det har også på, tror jeg, jeg kan sige nu, på en lidt mærkelig måde, så er der sådan en en gerne man finder, hvad er jeg, og øh, hvad vil jeg? Morten Østergaard er altså færdig som leder af de radikale. En chokmaling, der kom efter et maratonmøde i de radikale folketingsgruppe. Hun overtager den radikale right, depeche. Uh, let me stop it here, and then I'll, I'll try to explain what you see in the, uh, in the picture here. So, uh, first of all... Um, there's a, um, a transcription going on of a podcast. So this is a podcast from uh, Denmark's radio. So in the slides, there's a, a link to the uh, to the podcast. So if you get interested in it, you can drag it down, see what is happening. And then uh, the transcription is used for, for two things that uh, sort of uh, complement the discussion we've had here. Um, so first of all, we, we have a sentiment tool. So you can see that this is all in Danish. So sorry for, for those who are, uh, are new to Danish. Um, I hope when you see the writing, you, you can recognize the words. But uh, we have two interesting tools that uh, we can bring in. So those are natural language processing tools that are produced by our collaborators at the Exabler, the data science group. Uh, so it's a tool that can, um, using, again, the deep network for, for natural language processing that can produce the sentiment. So a guess of whether this is uh, positive, uh, negative, or uh, neutral in, in the emotion that are, you know, arouse in, in people that listen to it. And then the other uh, thing that uh, I mentioned was this uh, link with the knowledge graph and the, um, for example, Wikipedia's uh, knowledge and, uh, and structure. So um, in the text, um, we can use a tool to find uh, objects that potentially could have um, a Wikipedia uh, article, and then we show those uh, articles. So as you look at it, there'll be a, a face showing the emotion. There'll be some uh, curves below the face, and those are the sort of strength, the probabilities of the three emotions. And then on the uh, left side, there's a, um, uh, some clips from Wikipedia that are sort of uh, currently relevant uh, stuff from Wikipedia that the algorithm picked up from the text. And now with that, let me start again. 
da MeToo fælder Morten Østergaard. Og det bliver altså partiets... Fordi øh, politik på nogen stræk, synes jeg, er gået lidt i stykker. Der er for mange tomme løsninger, der er for meget, øh, nu siger det i overskriftsform, altså symbolpolitik, og enormt meget tid brugt på at positionere os. I skal have klik som journalister, og vi skal have like som politikere, men det bliver dårligere løsninger for borgerne, så det er det sidste, jeg er allermest optaget af. Hele Sofie Carsten Nielsens voksne liv har været sovset ind i politik i forskellige afarter. Fra Europakollegiet i Brygge, politisk konsulent i Europaparlamentet, til centraladministrationen og så en politisk bane i Folketinget. Men har du og dit parti ikke også selv en rem af huden her? Jeg mener, jeg kan da huske, at Morten Østergaard flyttede ud i en lejlighed hos nogle indvandrere. Han svømmede ud til øen Lindholm, fordi man var imod det. Altså noget, der vel også kunne karakteriseres som symbolstunts? Jo, selvfølgelig. Vi har alle sammen et ansvar, og vi er mindst lige så mange gange faldet ned i rillen. Men hvis du er nået frem til den der konklusion om, at du bør stoppe i politik, der er for meget symbolpolitik, for mange hurtige Facebook-opdateringer, ting du ikke kan genkende, hvorfor i alverden bliver du så i det? Nu er du jo formand. Ja. Øhm. Og det gør jeg, fordi jeg gerne vil prøve at lave det om. Så det hænger ikke sammen med, at du nu pludselig også får en mulighed for at nå den ypperste magt, og så tænker man, hvor der var, så bliver jeg alligevel. Jamen, det er da meget interessant. Altså, det vil jeg egentlig godt øh, tage på mig. Og så svarede du. Vi går lige så langt, det skal være, om det, vi kan blive enige om. Hvad betyder det? Så er vi lige til at lave et flertal med dem om den aftale. Og det betyder ikke for min skyld, at regeringen øh, skal gå af. Og jeg går ud fra, at øh, de også vil finde interesse i at være med. Men det er vel usandsynligt at lave en aftale med de borgerlige, et flertal udenom regeringen, på noget så væsentligt som den økonomiske politik, og så forestille sig, at regeringen ikke vil gøre det til et kabinetspørgsmål? Ja, men jeg vil også forestille mig, at regeringen ville synes, at det var rigtig, rigtig interessant at være med i en sådan forhandling. Kunne du forestille dig, at Søren Pape blev statsminister en dag, og du støttede ham? Ja, altså, jeg kan forestille mig mange ting, og det er ikke sådan, at det på nogen måde skræmmer mig overhovedet ikke. Så ja, det kunne jeg da godt forestille mig. Så er altså en situation, der nærmest minder om 80'erne, hvor lyttere også har de radikale støtte. Hvor realistisk er det? Jeg tror faktisk godt, og jeg synes, der er opbrud i dansk politik. Og jeg tror også, det er på en måde, som vi ikke nødvendigvis har set før, og derfor er det også svært at forestille sig. Men vi kan se til andre lande og se nogle helt andre koalitioner. Og jeg vil også bare sige, at jeg vil gerne være med til at prøve noget nyt, hvis politikken er den rigtige. So uh, I hope that it was uh, easy to to uh, to get sort of the feeling of what you can uh, can do now with uh, transcription and uh, and AI. Um, if you have technical questions, of course you are most welcome to to post them. Also, so we have Martin and, and Rasmus here also who can can help uh, answering. Should we take a look at the chat, maybe? I have a question. Go ahead, Sian. <laughs> um, how like what is the What stage is the are the sentiment prediction models in English? Is it something similar, or do they have a wider range of emotions that they can detect? Oh, do you know that? Sorry, sorry, I just need to kill this. <laughs> um, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I just had to stop the uh, play. It was uh, starting to play again. Nice. Um, so, so, uh, so the question was about um, sentiment analysis and how well it works in, in different languages and so on. Yeah, um, is is this I, yeah, kind of so, on par so with? I, I bet you that it's it's better in English because there's so much more data available. Uh, but it's it's working pretty well in Danish also, I would say. Um, absolutely. <clears throat> so there there are several uh, different ways of uh, of training the systems, um, the natural language processing systems for sentiment. Uh, so some of them uh, can be done with sort of like a big data style, uh, for example, using uh, the fact that people give reviews and uh, label give quantitative labels in reviews. That's one of the type of data set you use for it. But again, they are bigger and and uh, more ra- wider range in in international uh, in in English. And is that on the cards for Dan speech? 
to develop. Yeah, absolutely. So, so, are, so, yeah. Uh, so th that particular dimension now was uh, was something we borrowed from the colleagues at the Excel Birth Data Science. So we, we just do the transcription, but but that's one feature that you can build on top of the uh, transcription is to uh, to extract emotion. There's an equally important type of emotion in speech, and that's how the speaker speaks. Uh, so we have done quite a bit of uh, sort of academic work on that also, and there are some in really interesting data sets on, on that dimension also. So you can transcribe both the content and the uh, and the form. So how how people, I mean, is it a happy voice or a sad voice or a tired voice and so on? That kind of information you can extract from the audio signal also. Yep. Martin yeah. and Erasmus, I don't know if you have anything to uh, to add. I think it covers it up quite quite nicely. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, how does it cope with regional accents? Could be Martin. <laughs> Have you done much testing? <laughs> yeah, so I'm laughing. Um, so, so modeling a regional accent is uh, essentially like modeling a new new language. Uh, so the model that you saw in, in production here only does Istesk, uh, which is the broadest accent in Denmark, uh, really well. It doesn't perform as well. So uh, the data set that we trained on does have different, let's call them accented versions of Listatsk, uh, but it doesn't have Sunius, which introduces a new vocabulary as well. Um, it's definitely something that ideally we would like to do. Um, but then again, as last said early on, uh, then speech is trying to become a spin out. Uh, the idea is to, to make a profitable business as well. Um, so right now we're focused on, uh, on Listatsk and then as, as money and time allow it, we will introduce accents as well. Okay, and who are your potential customers? Um, in well, Denmark, that's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really it's a broad question. Um, so as Lars put some different names on one of his slides, uh, so you have potential customers who do have a lot of sound. Um, so that could be Podimo, it could be Heartbeats, it could be a DR. Uh, so you know any kind of company who has a, a large amount of of data which is audio based and has speech in it uh, that they would like to utilize. It can also be somebody who processes data uh, directly. So we're in discussion with some companies where you have applications that have a particular vocabulary, for instance, or have a very sensitive uh, environment uh, in terms of, of noise where a general speech solution might not be enough. You will have to do some sort of denoising first. You will have to do proper segmentation. There might be impulse sounds that kind of interrupts the system. Um, and then on top of that, you might have a very specific vocabulary, say, if I was a customer and I had a, a company that did something in, in carpentry, I might have a lot of code words and I might have a lot of particular uh, words that I use uh, that wouldn't pop up in a, in a common uh, data analysis. And so if like analyze the internet, you would not see these words occurring as frequently as you would uh, in the application. So, so essentially, those are the two customer segments, right? You have, have those who have a, a huge amount of data and kind of want to leverage that data and get insights into that data. And then you have the ones who have a very specific uh, use case where you might need to do some tweakings to the system. Mm, so depending on the requests you get from these potential customers, then you can really like tailor yeah, so your I solution think, to what, yeah. Exactly, yeah. so I think you can think of, of Dan speech or whatever we're going to call the company when we get that far as uh, as a one-stop shop, uh, so to speak. So we uh, asked us and asked to talk a lot more about this. So, so right now we're cloud-based and, and what we do is that we make an efficient hostable solution, right? Uh, and then what we really want to do is that we want to build up this platform that takes state-of-the-art language processing in, in niche languages, uh, but not necessarily only niche, but also different accents for English. And then we want to make sure that anyone has access to super high perf uh, performance state-of-the-art solutions that is associated with language processing. Um, and then a, a part of the, the idea, what we really want to do is, of course, we want to have some forward deployed engineers, uh, et cetera, to be able to help kind of manage these solutions, right? But ideally, we want to host them and make sure that everybody can get their hands on state-of-the-art uh, language processing solutions. Wow. Sounds ambitious. <laughs> yeah, that's the vision. <laughs> that's great. Let's, let's also share that. Uh, so on, on the slides, uh, that I think you're going to distribute the slides, Shelley, wasn't that the idea? So uh, yes. when you get the slides, then um, there are some links uh, to demo versions in the, uh, so there's a GitHub repo where, with the early version of it, at least. Take a look at the details, see how it works.
Does anyone have any further questions from the panel, perhaps? I have a few more, if, if you don't mind. So, so there's a, a <laughs> question. There's, there's a really interesting question in the chat. Uh, okay. So, so, uh, so one, yeah, precisely. Uh, thank you. So, so one, one of the um, the question is, uh, do you know of any studies where uh, speech attributes or patterns uh, could detect uh, the early signs of disease, for example, mental mental illness or Alzheimer's and so on? Right. That's the that's the question. I guess everybody can see the chat, right, Shelley? So, so yeah. Okay. But fine. So, um, so that's a super interesting question, and that's something we're also uh, thinking of as a, as a development of, of this project. Uh, so then, of course, a lot of uh, medical dialogue going on in, in, in Denmark between patient and uh, doctors, but also stuff that you could simply pick up if you listened in on the phone, right? So in the first uh, domain, the um, medical dialogue between a doctor and a patient, there's a very strong uh, company already in Denmark, Corti, that, you, that many of you have heard of. Um, was founded, uh, the technical founder, Lars Um So they, they have developed that uh, tool uh, that can detect the uh, keywords, for example, in the medical uh, emergency calls, for example, that, that is in use in, in, in uh, many places, both in Denmark and also outside Denmark. So it's a huge success. Uh, but that, that whole domain is, is big and that it, it's much beyond also those particular applications. Um, it has a little bit of the same flavor as what Martin was talking about with the special, uh, specialized vocabulary. Uh, so for example, um, one domain that we're looking at is in psychiatry. So this would be the uh, mental illness uh, question that uh, Julian was uh, referring to. There, there's some very important information that is lost today in, in the discussion between uh, a caretaker or a, or a psychiatrist and the patient. Uh, so, of course, the, the psychiatrist can remember something afterwards, but sort of a full sort of uh, data analytic uh, module that could uh, analyze the, the, the conversation and uh, pick up uh, important uh, biomarkers in, in, the, in the way people speak, for example. Uh, so there's a huge literature in that. Uh, I think that would be super interesting. And of course, it, it will happen to be in, in, in the native language. So this would be Danish and maybe even the dialect, as you ask, Shelley. Um, so we know that the, the, the current tools that we have, they work pretty well for um, base stamps that are pronounced by people living in places where they have a dialect. So that's part of the data set that we originally traded for. But, but the, if, if you speak uh, Sunoyusk, uh, then it uh, doesn't work so well. Um, and again, this is something that you'll have to develop right? so for the medical case. Very, very, very interesting and good question. Yeah, perhaps you could detect sociopaths, psychopath, you know, dangerous people, maybe. Yeah, also that, <laughs> before um, they do any damage. So, so, so this um, that there's actually some, so, I mean, sort of uh, going down that uh, that direction. There, there's uh, a, in the historical. Uh, we I'll say this is uh, 10, 15 years ago uh, when people started to mount cameras um, in inner city to to avoid the uh, criminal. Or detect uh, hooligans and so on. There's been a lot of effort in that, particularly in, in Britain, but in, in uh, other places in Europe, they did not say too much. Um, they actually had microphones also. And, and they were, those microphones were, were set up so they could detect angry uh, speech. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. So if you, if you say something, uh, an angry joke, then you are arrested uh, two minutes later. Right? <laughs> So, <laughs> but really, there might be some telltale signs of people who appear to be professional and more normal. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's so you can almost, uh, I mean, without thinking too much, it's just really uh, complicated and, and horrendous. Yeah. Uh, both privacy and security problem we are facing in that sense, right? Yeah. So, uh, so I think all, all these issues that uh, Kate Crawford that I mentioned in, in the books, uh, Kate Crawford's book, for example, I mean, it's just very much on those notes. I mean. What can go wrong? I mean, we know Murphy, right? So uh, we should care about things that can potentially go wrong. Definitely. I like when you said uh, <laughs> AI reflects values and perhaps Facebook's values are not aligned with ours. Yes, so we, we actually, 
Yeah. So uh, I didn't speak too much about that, but uh, but we we happen to know what values they have. Uh, so we have one of one of the, the top engineers in Facebook is, is from our group. So he from time to time he's visiting and talks about what how what they optimize. And I can tell you, it's it's not uh, something that is good for you. <laughs> is it Pablo? Uh, no, it's uh, Joaquin Candela. Mm. Isn't his name. Okay. I think we had a Pablo here, so <laughs> someone from Facebook in the audience. Um, yeah, I mean, Facebook is a very interesting business, and they they have super. Uh, I mean, their engineers are fabulous. I mean, of course, they have super top people, but uh, values is still important, right? That's uh, it's top of lab. <laughs> yes, the values are important. Yeah. Do we have any other uh, any other questions before we wrap it up? I have a question. There has been some uh, political attention on the AI area in general, and some uh, early signs of, of a political control of the area of regulation. Uh, how do you see that? Is that something that has to come in the future? So, so historically, we have uh, contributed a little bit to that also. Uh, so I, I mentioned these, what we call the safe AI principles that are sort of like a, a checklist for, uh, for making sure, for example, that values are, are aligned. And uh, we, we presented those um, when, when we started really building up uh, that there should be big investments in AI in Denmark, as has been happening across Europe and, and uh, China and USA and so on. We, we thought that it was important that if we started to invest a lot in Denmark in this area, then we are conscious about uh, these uh, potential dimensions also of uh, ethics and, and security. And um, I, I think that's what we could call sort of a special uh, European way. So a little bit like GDPR has uh, sort of uh, Europeans have led the way. So in, sometimes by giving constraining our, our engineering, we, we certainly win in business, right? I mean, this is what happened with the windmills, for example, and so on. I think that uh, that something similar can happen in AI. That uh, that we have sort of a specific, a specific European way that has a lot of, of uh, respect for the individual. So uh, now, without being uh, very political or, or polemic, let me say that, that that's what is common to the Chinese and the U.S. system is that there's too little respect for the individual, right? The traditionally we say that the Chinese uh, system is, is is very system focused. So so the individual is is uh, below the club, so to speak, right? Like in football, and uh, the um, in the U.S., it's it's simply the the power that builds up with big corporations that, uh, in a way, is oppressive towards the individual and so not always respect the individual. So I think that was what uh, this day and and uh, and the whole of of the European way of thinking about it is, is to to make sure that it's it's business, but it's also business with uh, corporate social responsibility, as we, as we call it. Uh, so, so I'm quite sure that there will be uh, something. Uh, there will be sort of like an auditing system for AI. So, already now we have very we have you know, both uh, the economical side of the company, the uh, the uh, footprints and and the uh, ethics and so on are, are already uh, audited. So, so I think we should simply include AI in sort of these dimensions that you audit uh, as a company, uh, define your values, and make sure that you live up to them. <laughs> Um, have you so defined your values in, in Dan's speech yet? Sure. Let, let me just. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so, so, uh, so I mentioned a few of them, and uh, Rasmus and Martin can can supplement. So, so privacy, for example, is a very important one. That we want to, to make sure that uh, it's private. But there's actually a question that relates to a value also in the chat. So this is Eske who's asking how demanding and how much processing power does it require to run Dan's speech in real time. So that I think we will simply uh, defer to Rasmus because we should think a lot about uh, how much uh, CO2 we produce when we uh, when we run these systems. So Rasmus, I don't know if you want to say a few words about. Yeah, sure. Uh, so, uh, so 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 it's so so the most demanding part of the speech recognition pipeline is of course the actual ac ac actual audio processing from. Uh, that 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 converts the speech to probabilities, uh, uh, and 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 if we run that uh, on a GPU and batch everything, then we can transcribe a forty-minute podcast in like thirty seconds. Uh, so that's pretty fast. Uh, but actually, we uh, run all of our models uh, 
on a CPU uh, because that's cheaper for us and it's fast enough. Uh, and uh, with regards to, uh, to 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 running it on a mobile phone, so. So, so, so the newest models that we use, we haven't open sourced them yet. They will be open sourced at some point, but those models uh, are in a format so that you can use them in C++ code and also optimize them for mobile phones. Uh, and I think uh, those models can easily be run on a mobile phone in real time. Uh, it will require uh, at least one gigabyte of, of, of RAM uh, and quite a lot of CPU power, but it's definitely possible to run them on, on your phone. Uh, on a CPU. Thanks, so, Rasmus. Uh, and there's one more question in the chat. Let me just see if I can sum it up. So it says, very interesting. What about audio AI in industry applications, equipment failure, and so on? So I think that that is a really important question. Uh, that um, that whatever may, uh, system we do, uh, it will fail from time to time. So it has to be graceful in the way it fails. So one thing that and this is sometimes uh, what I refer to by saying that the systems have need to be some kind of uh, self consciousness is that they need to be sort of in in possession of this picture of themselves, also that they understand their role in the system, and they need in particular to understand the uncertainty of their decisions. So this is a very important thing for any decision making is that you know uh, not only what you want to decide on, I mean the classification label, but also the uh, probability and have a good calibrated uh, probability. And that's uh, something that will allow you to, to veto action, for example. So this is what we do as humans. So if we are too uncertain, then we stop doing, we don't do it, right? And it's exactly the same thing that we need these AI systems to, to operate under these conditions that they can um, end up with a veto saying that now we, we simply slow down or stop completely operation, right? And call for, call for help. Yeah, really good question. So I think Martin uh, wrote 1984 in, in the, uh, that's a super relevant uh, <laughs> pointer. So um, I guess many of you, uh, decode that immediately as the book, right? Uh, this book. Is that what he meant? So the 1984 <laughs> is, is, uh, is just this uh, horrendous, uh, so I, I'm a utopist basically. I, I believe in, in engineering and, and good, good in people, but I also know that uh, things can go wrong and, and uh, that novel is about how things can go wrong if there's too much control and so. Are there any final questions for today? That might be it. Yeah, so we just want to say thank you very much, Laz yeah, thank and you. Martin and Rasmus. And uh, it was a really great presentation. And all the best with Dan's speech. Thank you. Yeah. And of course, like we said, we'll send out the slides and information afterwards. And because we are brand new in the cluster, we would uh, love it if you could fill out the evaluation. That's really helpful for us and it helps us to create more good stuff in the future. So thanks everyone for taking part today. Yep. Bye.